Good morning. Welcome to Rose City Park Presbyterian Church on Zoom. Welcome to this mysterious place, this Zoom place, where our heads are framed in boxes that echo the boundaries of our homes in this time of sheltering in place. Here in this no place place, we greet one another. We share smiles and see one another and we recognize that we are yet alive. Welcome to this time of word and companionship. As we gather, we remember our baptism. We remember that we are a part of the family of God, even now, together in this way. Well, if you would like to join the tech team, we would welcome it. If you can edit videos or start a Zoom meeting or anything, let us know. Let myself know or Karen Labonte or Scott Greer or Jim Munson or Johanna Norton or the Dennis family, any one of us, and I'm sure I left someone out, um, we invite you to join. Or if you can make Google Slides, these are all fun things that we're all learning to do and um, during this time. So today at noon, we have our first Dismantling Racism class, and David has a special guest, uh, Judith Mowry that's going to help lead it today. We invite you all to join that class. I think it will be a really good experience, a, a journey together. Today we have communion, so if you have not gathered your food and drink, you can sneak away at any time to go grab it. I have orange juice and a tortilla for today for our family. Um, we have youth group at two o'clock. And now Lee Lawrence Moizo has an update about the General Assembly. Good morning. Um, just like our church and our congregation, the 
full denomination in its General Assembly met on Zoom with 500 commissioners and 149 advisory delegates and lots of tech staff in Louisville and, and scattered around the country. So they met on previous two um, weekends. Uh, the theme was certainly appropriate from Lament to Hope, and it was reflected the current issues of the pandemic and Black Lives Matter. And uh, all of the participants were also invited and uh, took part in a Poor People's Campaign experience. For me, the most exciting thing was the election of co-moderators that will lead our church for the next two years. They are Elder Ilona Street Stewart, the first Native American woman to serve as a moderator. She is the executive uh, for uh, the Synod of the Lakes and Prairies. And the Reverend Gregory Bentley, who is a black Presbyterian minister from, he serves a church in Atlanta, Georgia. Our stated clerk, uh, J. Herbert Nelson, was reelected for an additional four year term. The business committee, which always the first plenary is presenting the business that needs to come before the same, they tried to streamline everything and only deal with the very critical business that needed to come. So most reports were referred to the 2022 General Assembly, except for two reports. Uh, that were pulled off of that consent agenda. Um, they both dealt with Native American. Uh, one was funding um, the Native American Coordinating Council, and one was to really address the need for funding for the Native American church property. It is a report that said that 89 out of 92 of our Presbyterian related Native American chapels and churches were in dire need of repair and rebuilding. <clears throat> and those, those were approved by a very high majority margin. A special committee uh, report on racism, truth, and reconciliation, and a task force report from the Advisory Committee on, on Women's Concerns um, that was uh, to do research disparities of black girls and women were eventually referred to the next General Assembly following many comments uh, from commissioners. That was quite controversial. It continues to be um, the, um, there's lots of talk going around the denomination that that particularly the report on black girls and women needs to have work done right now. So if you see, if you follow any of the national Presbyterian news, you'll see people commenting on that. The assembly did pass a resolution stating that the church has been complicit in perpetuating injustice and pledges, and it pledges to confront and dismantle systemic racism at all levels. And we are certainly part of that. The commissioners worked hard to amend the resolution, that resolution to be as inclusive as possible. And also passed was a child and vulnerable adult protection policy for the National Church and our congregation has a task force working on that as well. So those are both timely. The per capita amount for General Assembly was set at $8.98 per member for 2021 and 2022. And of course, Presbytery and Synod amounts will be added to that. So we'll find out what we'll pay in January when we come back to, to worship. Um, and there's still lots of chatter about um, how to reform the per capita system in light of lower membership in our churches. The final, before our final worship, the final plenary, concluded with eight minutes and 42 seconds of silence in honor of George Floyd. And so that's just a taste of General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. And we lift up in prayer the, the churches around our nation and dealing with their own complicity, our own complicity in 
systemic racism and the need for real change. And we invite you again to the class at noon today on dismantling systemic racism. We lift up all of those who are struggling with coronavirus. We lift up all of those who are struggling with fear and discouragement and who are, are facing real mental health challenges during this time. We um, lift up all of those all of our black brothers and sisters we lift them up and we pray for our nation during this time and we pray for the world and now david i invite you to join me for the call to worship and i invite all of you to join for the call to worship thank you paulette come all who are weary of wealth of poverty of power of struggle of division. Come all who are heavy laden with too much, with too little, with anxiety, with fear, with anger. Come all who have hope, hope for liberation, for peace, for freedom, for the kingdom. Hear these words. See, I am making all things new. Let us worship God. Make a joyful voice of God, all creation sings your praise. Great your wondrous fearless plan, on itself through all the days. For yes, this your secret name, ages all yet still the same. <clears throat> Come and see what God has done. Pray the blessings to the just. Walk now, chosen to the sea. Brother and enemies to us. Let us lift a faithful voice. For God's mercies and rejoice. Bless the Lord, our wretched share. Let our songs of praise be heard. By whose justice we are tried, by whose grace our guilty fed. When our lives shall pitch upon, bring us to your heavenly home. Please unmute yourselves to join me in the passing of the peace. Let us be instruments of Christ's peace to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Next, Scott has the children's sermon to play for you. I'm so bored and sad and mad. Life isn't normal. We don't get to go anywhere or do anything. Well, Mom and Dad told me that we should be thankful for what we do have, like your toys. Hmm. I do love my toys. Huh. So I could be patient and wait until we can be normal again and be thankful? Hmm. Well, I am thankful for my toys and for you. Me too. And I'm thankful for all of you guys. 
too. Yeah, we're thankful for you. I feel much better. Yeah. Unmute yourself. And now we have the um, scripture. Can someone needs to unmute. Oh, there I go. Here I go. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Yes, thank you. Uh, pray with me. O Christ, your holy scripture is before us. Open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading today is from Psalms chapter, six, uh, chapter 66, verses 5 to 12. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds among mortals. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There we rejoiced in him who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let the rebellious not exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O oh God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a spacious place. The second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is this that you were called, that you might inherit a blessing. For those who desire life and desire to see good days, let them keep their tongues from evil and their lips from speaking deceit. Let them turn away from evil and do good. Let them seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. That's why. Good morning. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, on this most beautiful morning, be with us as we gather together as your beloved children. In the land of Zoom, help us to hear what we need to hear and then help us to do what we need to do. In the name of the risen Christ, amen. So I went on one of those um, travel and leisure websites and it had all 50 states on it and it was talking about the rudest cities in each state of the country. So, of course, I look up like uh, um, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Minnesota, Minneapolis, um, Iowa, it was like Cedar Rapids. And then, of course, I look up Oregon, and here's what it said about the rudest city in the state of Oregon. 
Portland might have a reputation for being weird, but Portland is starting to develop a reputation for being rude as well. That's a strange combo, but when it comes to strange, no one does it better than Portland. If you happen to be visiting, don't expect politeness or rudeness, but rather expect the unexpected. So your word, your good news about our beloved city of Portland, Oregon. This is an old preacher's story, but I think it uh, bears some truth. There's a story about a, a family and they are in their car and they're going toward a small town that uh, could be their new home if one of the parents took a job there. And as they drove in, they saw a woman out in her yard, so they pulled over. And the dad got out and asked the woman, what are the people like in this town? And she asked him, well, what were the people like in the last town that you lived in? And he replied, they were awful. People gossiped a lot. They complained about their neighbors. They found fault in one another. They held grudges and they were very quick to pick a fight. Well, the woman said, that's what you're gonna find in this town. Later it happened that another person was driving into the same town, saw the same woman gardening in her yard. The driver stopped her car, got out and said, you know, I'm thinking about moving here. What are the people like in this town? And the gardener replied, well, what were they like in the last town that you lived in? And the woman replied, oh, they were great. People were really nice and they were friendly to each other. They looked out for each other's homes when someone was out of town. They called on their neighbors when someone was in the hospital or when a problem arose in a family. They brought out the best in one another. They forgave one another and they worked together to solve whatever the issue might be. Well, said the gardening woman, that's what you're gonna find in this town. Isn't it true that experiences in our life really depends a lot on whether we carry a loving or hopeful approach to it or a divisive, discouraging approach? So when you're living your life, do you live your life as if you've been blessed or do you live your life as if you're a victim? Certainly, I will grant that there are people uh, whose lives have brought them much pain, not of their own doing. There are people who suffer from illness or grief, abuse or neglect, and there are people who are mistreated and diminished because of their race or because of their income level or, or because of their age. But I think the big difference is, what do you and I do with that particular pain? We can choose to embrace fully that we are made in the image of God and live as people who are healed and made whole by God's grace. Or we can live as people crippled and just stuck in bitterness and be angry and be resentful. What Gail read to us in the first letter of Peter, she said, do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay it with blessing. It is for this that you are called, that you might inherit a blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. And the Apostle Paul in Romans, he says something kind of along the same line when he writes, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Over and over again, you and I find this particular theme, that we as Christians are called to bless and not to curse. The truth of the matter is, we find out who we are through other people. We find out who we are through other people. John Updike writes, we get our bearings daily from other people. You know, if you tell someone over and over and over again that they're a failure or that they're not going to amount very much, 
And pretty soon, people are going to start to act that way. Do you know what you've done to them when you do that? You've actually cursed the other person. You haven't now, you haven't uttered any voodoo. You don't have some kind of a doll somewhere that you're sticking pins in, but maybe you do. I don't know. <laughs> but you have just as effectively put a curse on them. You know, if you tell a child that she's not going to amount to very much or compare children with others, that's a curse as well. Because they're going to grow up believing that they don't amount to very much. And they'll probably do some self-defeating thing when they grow older just to prove the curse that was put on them. On the other hand, you could do something which is quite different. If you tell people that they're created in the image of God or that God loves them and that they have great potential, that they can even fail and it doesn't matter because we all make mistakes, if you can honestly tell another person that, to do better because they're children of God or just keep on trying in your life, the likelihood is, is that they will keep on trying, that they will do their best and perhaps even eventually succeed in life. What you've done in that case is you have given the other person a blessing. So tell a child that they are unique, that there's nobody else just like them. And therefore, what she has to offer in this life is unlike whatever anybody else can offer. Uh, I came across the story of a little boy. And it, she's, he was in preschool, and it was one of those um, preschools where the teacher gave out um, great big stars that the, the kids could wear if they did something really well. And so this little boy went home. And he had his great big star on. and. Uh, the teacher blessed that child by giving that little boy that great big star. And uh, one of the little boy's parents said, what is that great big star for? And he responded, I got that star because I am the best, very best rester in the whole class. A true story. Derek Dawson is a black man who grew up on the south side of Chicago. He was raised by his parents to value and pursue higher education, and he did very well academically. He attended a university in Colorado, and for one of his classes, he wrote an excellent paper on the problem of homelessness. After the professor had graded all of the students' papers and uh, handed them out, the professor had handed all of the papers out except for Derek's paper. The professor instead asked Derek to meet him in his office. And in his office, he said the following to Derek, I really don't believe that you wrote this paper because you are a black boy who grew up on the south side of Chicago. Derek insisted that he had written that paper the professor then made him take a blank paper and to write a new paper in front of him while he watched. That experience had a scarring uh, impact on Derek, and it was one of the most shameful moments of his life, because at that time he felt he had no choice but to succumb to his professor's humiliation. Derek even tempted to give up on his education after that experience. Let's fast forward a little bit. Derek got involved in an Episcopal church in Chicago, Illinois. His black gay priest encouraged all members of that congregation to go through some anti-racism training. And Derek did that, which moved Derek then to view himself and that whole incident that happened to him in college in Colorado in a new light he realized that his college professor was not just acting out of a personal racial prejudice, but rather he was a product and embodiment of systemic racism, where those people who are in positions of power misuse that power against others based on their race. 
His diminishing treatment of uh, Derek had nothing to do with Derek's worth or, or Derek's particular abilities. Later, Derek uh, worked for a major law firm in the city of Chicago. He was part of a legal team working over a weekend on a very large case. It was one of the earliest days of cell phones. And when people were talking a lot on their cell phones and uh, how to use them, it's kind of like um, Zoom right now. You notice how many times during the worship hour we say, uh, Joe, you're muted, unmute yourself. Jill, you're muted, unmute yourself. Well, this was in the early days of cell phones. And after one of the conference calls of the team, the team manager didn't hang up his phone. So his comments were recorded on Derek's phone. And he could hear that managing lawyer was asked by another how it was going. And the manager responded, well, it's going pretty well. Except our firm has hired too many. And insert the N-word right here. Derek didn't want to believe what he had heard. He asked his sister to listen and to say what she had heard, and she confirmed it. Then, because of Derek's training and anti-racism, he decided to bring a suit against his firm, and he not only won that suit, true story, but he proceeded to work at the same firm for another decade. And in that decade, he worked with others to break the curse of racism. They transformed that practice by intentionally and strategically creating an effective pipeline that led to many people of color being employed in that particular law firm. Now, you might say in response to that story, wait, Derek sued his own law firm, the one that he worked for? How is that following the teachings of scripture? Isn't that really repaying evil with evil or, or abuse with more abuse instead of responding with a blessing? Think about it. When you are breaking the curse of racism and injustice, you are making way for a blessing. It is a blessing, folks, to be able to stop abuse and evil from reoccurring. You know, racism hurts not only people of color, but racism also hurts white people in power. We must be careful not to assume that Giving others a blessing simply means being nice. You could say in the Midwest, Minnesota nice. Or going along with the status quo or, or going along just to get along with one another. Returning evil or abuse with a blessing can mean working for justice so that all people may thrive as God's beloved children in whom God actually delights. Now, the... Uh, First Peter suggests on how to be a blessing. So um, when you have time, go back and look at that scripture once more. And several things are listed about how to be a blessing. Unity of spirit, sympathy and love for everyone, plus a tender heart and a humble mind. A humble mind. That means giving the other person the benefit of the doubt thinking the very best of others and honoring their gifts and their abilities. A humble mind means not being an arrogant person, not assuming that you know what is best for the other, not passing judgment on others as if you yourself were actually better than they are. It also means believing that others are capable of change and calling forth their highest selves. A tender heart. Now, the Greek word for this means compassionate. Compassionate. It's the capacity to feel what other people are feeling, to put yourself in another person's place, to enter into another's life so that you can understand better what they might be going through. Another true story. Rachel Gregerson is black and her husband Eric is white. Notice that their eight-year-old daughter was the only African-American in her class at school. And Rachel said, I was seeing the world through my daughter's eyes for the very first time. It's important for children 
to see a reflection of themselves, to see the beauty in themselves, and to know that they are not odd. So she and her husband decided to transfer their daughter to a school with a greater mix of black and white students. You know, their concern is also why it is important for us in the church to have different people leading worship, having different people, people of color, serving as church officers. This one we do, having music from many different cultures. And to notice that if a person is sitting alone, being able to join them, we need to learn to convey uh, intentionality that God and we value everyone and help all feel as if they belong in our community. Not that we want to make them into what a good member of Rose City Park Presbyterian Church should be, not to follow all of the rules that we have had throughout our history, but to honor them for where they are and where they find themselves right now. Being compassionate also means that you share in another person's suffering. You know, when we're able to, it might mean being able to go over to their home and join them for tea, coffee, or whatever. Or visiting them in a hospital, writing a note of encouragement or sympathy. And I know that a lot of you really are very intentional about doing that or making a phone call. You know, it doesn't take a lot for you to be a blessing in another person's life. You know, you don't have to have answers. You don't have to have the right words to say. You really don't have to say anything, but it's your loving presence that matters. What suffering people want and understand is a caring presence. So having a tender heart also means loving yourself and refusing to accept as reality that others can diminish you, that others can tell you that you are less than, and in so doing hurt themselves. You know, there is something in every one of you, every single one of you, that is just crying out, crying out that I am a human being, I'm a child of God, treat me that way. And we who call ourselves Christians are called precisely to do that very thing. You and I are called to be tender-hearted with a humble mind. You and I are called to be a blessing to one another. Look at all of the different people in the little Zoom boxes. You are called to be a blessing to all of those folks that you see. Our Lord Jesus Christ was tender-hearted. He didn't regard the external reality of anyone's life. He looked at what was inside of everyone. He didn't abuse his exalted power over others, but he reaches out, especially to those whom society marginalizes. He proclaimed that they were loved as God's beloved children. He invited people into new life and called forth the very best in them. He didn't look only on what we have done, but on what we can be. We can live into our fullness as people made in the image of God. Jesus believed, if only you and I know who we are. He came to tell us who we are, not only with his words, but he also came to show us with his deeds, his deeds of tender compassion. And you and I, you and I, who follow Christ as his disciples, are called to do and to be the same. So in the days ahead, be a blessing with a tender heart and a humble mind, for that is your divine calling. May it be so. Amen. And now we will listen to our hymn. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my 
Now we come to a time of communion. We invite you now, if you haven't already done so, to go get something to eat and something to drink for communion. Where two or three are gathered in Christ's name, he is there, even when that gathering is virtual. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our space. In this time, our own time and place, we give you thanks and praise for giving us life and inviting us to share in the history of a people who are blessed by your faithfulness, challenged by your prophets, forgiven by your mercy, and ever surprised by your power working in us to do more than all we can ask or imagine. Therefore, we join our voices with voices of all you have created, all you have loved, all you sustain to praise you, saying, Holy, 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 holy God, God, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. We thank you for your we thank you for your life manifest in your brother Jesus, bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, whose life, death, and resurrection reveal you fully, your love for humanity, your desire for human freedom, your passion for justice. And now we pray as he taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We remember that Jesus gathered at table with his friends in a time of struggle and fear. He took bread, he blessed it. And he broke it and he gave it to them and he said to them, Take eat, for this is my body. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which was shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do so, proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And now... John will continue John you're muted let's see let's see John, can you unmute yourself? Okay. All right. Come now, Holy Spirit of God, as you were present at creation, be present now. And let these gifts of bread and cup become for us the bread of life and the cup of blessing 
as you were sent by Jesus to accompany us on our journey of faith, be present now and make this community in receiving this bread and cup, one body in Christ, the gifts of God for the people of God. I think I'm on now, I'm not. Yes, John, you're on. Thank you. Take, takes a while to see these things. John, would you like to do the prayer after communion? Am I on? Yeah, let me let me find it here. All right. Loving God, three in one, how precious you are to us. Make make us and mold us into a more loving people who give you glory in all we do. Empower us to work for a more just, kind, and humble world. Turn the page. Nurture us within, within us, the seed you have, pl you have planted. May we grow us as we are as may we grow as we are grounded in you. Amen. <clears throat> Live into all the captives free of sight we can be and to our commission and benediction. So now we leave the space of worship, and while so much of the road ahead is uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know some things that are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know that God is love, and we know that Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit, this there, found in the space between all things, closer to us than our next breath, binding us to each other until we meet again. Go in peace.